cold, but all right. All right. So, so that being said, about the atoms having to equal either as a reactant and as a product, we got to talk about, and we're gonna we'll talk about balancing reactions, okay? Balancing chemical reactions. Now, in when you're balancing chemical reactions, you have to make sure that you write down the correct formulas. That's why we put a lot of emphasis on the atoms and we talked about the charges. We talked about how group one elements that when they, they have one valence electron, when they lose that electron, they are gonna have a plus one. The group two, they're gonna have a plus two for the metals. And we also talked about group seven, all the halides. They, they're non-metals, they're gonna gain electrons and they're gonna pick one electron because they want that octet. They wanna emulate, they wanna be isoelectronic with the noble gas in front of them. All right, so group seven will pick up one electron. They end up with a negative one because they got an extra electron. Group six will pick up two electrons, and group you know five will pick up three electrons. So refresh your memory on those charges, because when we put them together to write a compound, we got to make sure we put enough positives and enough negatives together such that they cancel each other out. Also refresh your memory on on the periodic table, which again, I have written up here. If you haven't print, printed that out, print that out because we're gonna to refer to this quite a bit. We have the polyatomic ion table there, but right to the right, we're gonna have what we call the solubility rules. We kind of briefly talked about those uh, in the last chapter uh, about solubility rules, and we're gonna have more detail about that again here today. And then right above the solubility rules, we have the activity rules or activity series. That, that little series is gonna help us predict products or whether a reaction will occur or not, okay? So be familiar with those. And you know, if you haven't printed it out, kind of overemphasize, print it out and, and use it quite a bit. You don't have to memorize it because you have access to it, okay? All right, so, we write the right formulas, and then once we put the formula for the comp together, sometimes we have to put subscripts. Once we get that set, we leave the subscripts alone. If we need to add more of whatever compound, we introduce a coefficient, and that is that number in front of the element. In this example here, we know that hydrogen is a diatomic element. Okay, so we put a subscript two. We don't change that. If we need to add two, we need to have two hydrogen atoms, but then we put a coefficient. And that's what that is, the shape of the two. That coefficient, we can change any number of times for whatever value we need, okay? Notice in front of oxygen, we know it's diatomic, hence H2, but there's no number in front of it. It's understood as in mathematics that there's a one there. So that ratio between the hydrogen and the oxygen, oxygen is a two to one, another ratio. That's important. We're gonna use that ratio quite a bit later on in the next few chapters where we can use that ratio to predict how much product we're gonna get. In this example, we have hydrogen reacted with oxygen to form water. We all know that the formula for water is H2O. But if I want to show two molecules of water, then I put a coefficient right up front, okay? So the coefficient, we can change all we want, but we can't change the subscripts once we put them together. All right, so in this reaction, let me clear this up a little bit. I got too much stuff there, this erase all. You can see the by the space fill models here, we have the grays, which are represent hydrogen, we got four as reactants. And then as products, we still have four hydrogens and they're just in different form, okay? It's still hydrogen, but in different form. They're in the form of water. There's four of them. We have oxygen on the left-hand side represented by the white spheres, two of them. And then as products, there's there. So today, I was going to need this because again, the conservation of matter. We just kind of just forget the fact 
we need four hydrogens to get a balance it out. Okay. So now is, is, is uh, single reactions is actually a trial and error. Try uh, to see how that works. Try four here, four. Some of them are four. There's others that we have a little bit of balance. balance. This one here is a kind of trial and error, a little bit over here. A little bit of a guiding factor. Uh, it's actually a magnet reactive hydrogen to give us a three, which is one. Okay. Now, okay, notice we have three units there and two over here. Uh, here is two over there. So we have a disparity. We got two as reactions and three trials. What we can do in this example is we can find a common value for them, just like we do for uh, adding times like one four plus one six or one eight. We find a common denominator. Here we're finding a common denominator. Common number times to be six. So for the two prime, they put the one on the eight. Now six prime is nothing. Okay, now six prime is nothing. Okay, and we have six prime. Six prime is nothing. What it does is put the number of nitrogen in the problem. Because energies are actually going to be a two-dimensional reaction. So here we have a reaction, but it is that once it has balanced, yeah, hold on a second. It's balanced. We have a new ratio here. That ratio tells me that I need one molecule of nitrogen for every molecule of oxygen. And we use that ratio. We're going to use that ratio to make much more balance. There's another. Here we have gas. We're going to use it to HBr or something like that. We can simply put two of the R. And the fog is not going to be balanced. We have been using one and the ratio of five hydrogen to eight mark is all the same. And the one that is going to be rest. This is the final line of carbon and oxygen or carbon dioxide. Again, we do run, and we have some carbon dioxide, and it's going to run out of oxygen. Now, some of the boundaries are going to be like a second. Our consent level is like three oxygen from carbon dioxide from the oxygen. The product is going to be like a second. We're going to do the third key. We'll do the third key. We're going to do the third key. We'll 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 do the third key. Words and converting it to Else with it, so that you might have a lot of metal. So then it says, react with chlorine. Okay, again, that's what I need. Well, okay, I'm dealing with the chlorine. Part of it is that it's part of the have no fear of either. Okay, and then it makes it choose that. Yeah, that's right. So it's a good swimmer. And then it's a good swimmer. So it reacts with chlorine to do something. All right, so we have a little bit of a point out here. So we have sodium plus chlorine to give us a swimmer. And we have here's the interaction. So you know, which is very strong, very active, and very controlled. We got chlorine with gas, and chlorine is gas. And then another, you can write something that's much better. It's an old-fashioned table saw. And chlorine is gas. Seven months later, chlorine is gas. You can also change your paper later on. You can make price. And then it's totally different from gas. Now we can need balance in this case. Excuse me, what is this case? So we can grab people. It's not solid. Chlorine is one of the few gas we have. And chlorine, we probably told you, solid sort of price. We put it in states there. Then we can balance it. And we can end up with a new sort of price. And if you can balance it, you can balance it. 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 You can well, there's a problem with that. So, anybody has one of the claims, I only have one of the claims. So, that one is clear. Here's the reaction. I'm going to take a look at the power of the reaction. The first reaction is brain and very clear. The word, the word is between cash and brain. The brain is the number one. So, we have a reaction. We know that I know him. I saw him. We know that he is a brain. We know that he is a brain. We know that he is a brain. Now, we have to be back in the aluminum.
the reaction with the reaction formula, and 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 the reaction with the reaction formula, Reaction, as you well know, when you want to burn anything, needs oxygen. So you always need oxygen. Okay. Now, press here in, in chemistry, a combustion reaction is simply the burning or the combustion of the hydrocarbon in the oxygen. Any products you burn or not, it's carbon dioxide. Okay. That's it. And we have a link to help you out with the reactions. We're going to say that in a bit. As I said, this is a very few that we have left. We have an acid, noted by hydrogen, in first, and A, whatever it is, hydrochloric acid. And then we have a polycomic ion peroxide. When the proton and the oxide come together, always from water. Okay? And then the other two are from the water, and A, whatever that may be, just salt. So a neutralization reaction. This is called, it's called a single reaction. reaction. Now, if you look at this, you have a metal, a metal, a metal sitting here. And then you have a metal in a compound form, a salt. If reaction proceeds, a metal is exchanged. So now, now it was by itself, now it's in a copper. It's not a salt form. And then we took the A, which was in a salt form, and it has a metal. For example, this is like, this is what has to be placed in. I think that I'm going to get our system of the old paper. I am going to get the elemental form. Single laser reaction. And finally, the last thing is called double phase. This is analogous to the example I gave you in the slide triangle, where you have two salts, M1X with different cations, anions, and M2Y. And all they do is they convert. Okay? So M1X becomes M1Y, and M2Y becomes M2X. What drives this reaction is the solubility rules. So the time right there, if both oxygen are soluble water in the reactor, if there's a white solubility rule, soluble, then you form a solid in the reactor. So this one can use solubility rules. Give me a picture of the picture. That's the same picture. What drives the reaction is that this is a great deal. You look at the picture and it turns into more like it. It's also the same as 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 the same. Then M is not the so yes, it was a man. For single reactions, it was and for two reactions, we saw that we were going to react with the same we the we the same we form the and we form the same the same we form the same we we balance and we the same two we and then we balance the same we form 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 the and the reason I'm going to put it, I'm going to use a good doctor, 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 I'm going
And then lastly, I come back and put a four in front of iron to balance out the four irons that I have in iron three oxide. All right. Combustion reaction, as I mentioned, this only pertains to hydrocarbons. Those are compounds that are made up of nothing but hydrogen and carbon. Okay. In this example, we have uh, uh, C3H8, which is propane. Down here is the, the general formula for, for that three carbons, and then the whites represent the hydrogen. Okay. And in combustion reaction, the key reactant always is oxygen. For anything to burn, you need oxygen. Okay, so that's one of the reactants. Also for combustion reaction, as I mentioned earlier, the only two products that you get is carbon dioxide and water. Okay. Now we can balance in here, and now we got some rules that we can, some guidelines here when you balance chemical reactions. And I have a slide to that, but I can tell you quickly. When you're balancing combustion reaction of hydrocarbons, okay, you balance the carbons first, then you balance the hydrogens, and then at the end you final, final, finally balance the oxygen. So carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen first. Okay, so you can see here that when you began, you had three carbons here to begin with and one over here in carbon dioxide. So we put a three right there. I put in a three right there, and then we go back and look at the hydrogens. We got eight hydrogens right here, but only two here for in water. So we put a four there to balance the hydrogens. And then we finally add up the oxygens. That tells us that we have 10 oxygens all together in the product side. So by putting a five right there, that balances the oxygens. So you go back and forth, back and forth, carbon, hydrogen, then followed by oxygen. Okay, which is right here. Okay, order of balancing. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, last. Okay, and remember that Products for combustion reactions, hydrocarbons are always carbon dioxide and always water. That's only two products you're going to get. And oxygen is always a reactant, so it's got to be put in, in the reactant side. Acid base reaction. Okay, this was, we talked about this in the last chapter. We have an acid denoted by normally the hydrogen written first. And then we have the OH the hydroxide, which always will produce water and then the corresponding salt, MA, whatever MA would be. Okay. So we have down here in the bottom, we have hydrochloric acid and barium hydroxide. Notice something about barium hydroxide. There are two, two OHs. I need to neutralize those two OHs, but on hydrochloric acid, there's only one proton. When we're balancing acid-base reactions, follow the protons and the hydroxides, and the rest of them just fall in place. So that means that I need two, whoa, there you go. I need two HCLs, okay, because I have two hydroxides. And that means that I'm going to produce, guess what? Two waters. Because I have two hydroxides, two protons, I'm going to produce two waters. So I got two H2O. And then I just throw in the barium, the, the corresponding salt. When you put these salts together right here, write them out in salt form first. So you know that you put them together in the correct ratio. Barium in the salt form, it's in group two, so we have a plus two charge. Chlorides have a negative one, hence I need two chlorides for the plus two of barium. 
put them together and uh, making sure you put them in the right ratio. Okay. Look at the next one. We got calcium hydroxide and we have three protons coming from phosphoric acid. This is one of the weak acids we talked about last semester. Okay. I need to balance them out, but their numbers are not common. Okay, because I've got two on one side, three on the other, so I find a common number. Common number is six. That means if I put two in front of phosphoric acid and three in front of calcium hydroxide, it's supposed to be a three, by the way, uh, I would make six waters. Why? Because now I got six hydroxides and six protons. I'm going to make six waters. So I'm following oh, I'm following the, the acids. I put a two there and a three there. That tells me I'm going to make six waters. Okay, so my water is a balance. I put the calcium, the calcium chlor uh, phosphate Break it down into elements, into the ions before you put them together so you can put them together in their correct ratio. You'll see that calcium has a plus two, phosphate has a negative three. My common factor there is a six. Six negatives, six positives. I put them together in the same right ratio and that's my formula. And guess what? They, they fall into place naturally with respect to balance of the power. All right, here comes the single replacement reaction. This, again, we need the activity series to determine whether a reaction proceeds. And again, simple question, is the most reactive metal in compound form? If it is, then no reaction. If it's not, then there is a reaction, and we simply flip, uh, exchange partners. Okay. Um, Let's do so. Here's the activity series. Oh, come back. This activity series, which is found in a product table, tells me the way it's written is that lithium is the most reactive metal, and the least reactive metal is gold, right in the far right. Everything's relative to the hydrogen. Okay? And so uh, when we look, if we have something reacting with hydrogen, the compound form of hydrogen will be either in the form of a proton or in the form of water, H2O. The elemental form of hydrogen obviously is H2. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll, we'll come back to that here in a bit. Okay, there's an example. All right, check out the activity series, find out which is more reactive, find out if the extracted compound is, is in compound form. If it is, there's no reaction. If it's not, then we just switch the partners and then we write the right, right formula. And then fi finally, make sure you put in the right states of the products. Okay. Finally, at the end, you balance the reaction. All right, let's take a look at this one. Now, first thing we do is we compare the metals. Now, we don't care if they're an solid. Uh, element to form or ionic form. We're just comparing zinc versus sodium. We find sodium on the, on the activity series and we find zinc in the activity series, okay? Sodium is more reactive than zinc, okay? Second question, is the most reactive metal in compound form? No, it's not. It's an element to form. Therefore, reaction proceeds, we exchange partners, okay? And so sodium now becomes, becomes sodium nitrate. Zinc, which was an ionic form here, now is an elemental form because sodium is a lot more reactive. Now, again, when you put these guys in salt form, write them separately first in ionic form before you put them together. Okay, to make sure you got the right, right uh, ratio. Okay, then we put in the, um, let me get rid of that excess stuff. 
and we put in the uh, uh, the state. Okay, we're dealing with aqueous solution, so sodium nitrate is aqueous, and zinc is solid. Okay. All right. Now, why wouldn't it be? Why would it? it why would it be incorrect to write as Na parentheses NO3 negative? Uh, NO3 in such group two. Okay. Why would this be incorrect? Because we know, again, from the polyatomic ions, that the nitrate ion, NO3, is a negative one. There's two of them. It implies that sodium is a plus two, and we know that's not the case because sodium is a group one, has a plus one charge, and a plus two charge, okay? And finally, copy cat. <laughs> not copy that. Don't copy the photos from the left side to the right because th that may be incorrect. Break them down into the ions for first before you put them together as far as products. Okay, look at this example. We have a compare. We have to compare reactivity of strontium and aluminum. Okay, uh, gonna find aluminum right there. Strontium right there. Okay, the most reactive metal is strontium (Sr). Second question, is it in compound form? Answer, yes. Okay, and guess what? No reaction. Okay, so over here, we will write a big uh, NR. No reaction, it's supposed to be NR. Okay, no reaction at all. Because SR is a lot more reactive. Hold on one second. I got a question. Let me find out. My chat function is not working. Uh, the question is in the activity series, are they all metals? Yes. If you look at the activity series, the only one that is not metal is hydrogen, which is right, where to go? Right there. Okay. The ionic form of hydrogen, the elemental form, as you know, hydrogen is H2, but it could be in the form of the ionic form of hydrogen could be the proton, okay, that's a plus, or H2O, okay, depends on the reaction. So hydrogen is diatomic, so that's the elemental form, okay, or the ionic form of hydrogen could be either H plus or H2O. All right, good question, but generally, yes, for metals, they're only metals except, except hydrogen, because they made this series relative to hydrogen gas. All right, here's, here's an example, okay? And so here, we are looking at the reactivity of hydrogen and aluminum. Now, the elemental form of aluminum, of hydrogen, is H2, okay? And if we go back to the activity series, who's more reactive, hydrogen or aluminum? Well, aluminum is more reactive than hydrogen. So this reaction will proceed, okay? And so hydrogen, which has a H plus in this form, Okay, it's a proton, now goes to elemental form, which is hydrogen gas. Right there. You're still displacing it just because it's hydrogen, it's, it's still the same because this activity series is relative to hydrogen. So hydrogen goes from H plus to H2, and then we make aluminum chloride. Then we uh, balance it out. All right, so there are uh, YouTubes on the, on the website concerning this particular reactions. By all means, go go check them out. Make sure that they are they are um, that you're familiar with. Them, okay, give you more information because <laughs> we're we're basically just pushing right through this this chapter here. So this flowchart kind of breaks it down with respect to uh, single replacement reactions, most reactive metal, 
if is it in cell form? The answer is no. Then re reaction proceeds. If the answer is yes, then we get no reaction. Okay. All right. Double displacement reaction. Right where we have AX plus BY, two compounds. They're both soluble in water. Okay. Nothing's happening until we put them together. Partners are exchanged. So AX becomes BY, BY becomes BX. What drives this is the solubility of your products. If the, if, oh, if the uh, solubility rules define one of these products to be insoluble, meaning we get a solid and reaction proceeds. If the solubility rules for both, for both these products define them as both being soluble, then we have no reaction, okay? One of the products must be insoluble for a reaction to proceed, okay? And because of the solubility, we form a precipitation, a solid form or a precipitation, okay? We call that a precipitate. Uh, and um, again, if you do get a solid, that reacts because of the solubility rules, reaction proceeds. All right, that's a rehash of what I just stated. So it brings us to the solubility rules, okay? Now, we have two columns here. This is the soluble column, and this is the insoluble column. All right. Let's go over the, very quickly over the soluble column, which uh, was red. All right. If any anion, anything with negative charge is is partnered with lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium ion, always soluble, all the time, hundred percent. Okay. That's and that's for number one, two, and three. Acetate ion and nitrate ion, regardless of what its partner is, its cation is positive charge, that molecule will always be soluble. The same is true for bromine, chlorine, and iodine. Always soluble with the exception, with the exception if it's bonded with silver, mercury, or lead. If any of those halides are bonded with those three heavy metals, it is insoluble. Okay? The sulfates, number five, when it's bonded with anything other than calcium, strontium, barium, silver, and lead, if it's not bonded to any of those, they are soluble, okay? Otherwise, those five are insoluble. Pretty straightforward, I, I believe. Everything soluble unless it's bonded with the exception. Okay, on the other direct, on the other side, the insoluble. So for the carbonate, the chromate, and the phosphate, let me clear this up a little bit. Carbonate, chromate, phosphate, any cation bonded with those three are insoluble to the exception if they happen to be bonded to number one on the soluble column, okay? So if you have potassium or lithium or ammonium or sodium carbonate, chromate or phosphate, they are soluble. Everything else, insoluble, okay? Number nine, same thing, the sulfides, normally all of them are insoluble unless they're bonded with the four of number one or calcium, strontium, and barium. So there are seven examples where sulfide ions are soluble, only seven, and everything else is bonded to are insoluble. The hydroxide, same scenario. Normally, they're when they're bonded to anything, any other cation, they are insoluble with the exception of the four from one and calcium hydroxide, strontium and barium. Seven, they're soluble, okay? So there's only 
a few, a couple of exceptions to the rule if it's whatever column they're in. Okay, so that that's how that table works. So we're, we're going to use it to figure this out. Now we're going to have here we're going to left hand side reactant barium nitrate reacting with magnesium sulfate. Exchange the partners. We end up with barium sulfate and magnesium nitrate. Okay. Using the solubility rules, okay, <coughs> we can determine who is insoluble or soluble. Exchanging the partners. Now, my suggestion when you write the formulas out for the products, to first break them up as ions and then put them together with the correct ratio, okay? And so if you do that, you end up with barium sulfate because the sulfate has a negative two. The barium has a plus two, so that's correct. Magnesium has a plus two, but nitrate has a negative one, so we need two of them, okay? Once you've got them together, look at the solubility rules. You'll find that the nitrates are always soluble, okay? But the sulfates are soluble except when they're bonded to barium and therefore we have a solid, okay? And therefore we have a reaction. Once we do that, we know the reaction. To balance these, when it comes to these type of reactions, for double replacement reactions, follow the polyatomic ions, okay? Follow the polyatomic ions to balance, we can see Barium nitrate, we got two nitrates. Reactant side, go over to the product, magnesium nitrates, we got two nitrates, so they're balanced. We got one sulfate as reactant as magnesium sulfate. Over here, and we have one over here. All right, I'll hold on my pen. We got one sulfate there, one sulfate there, they're balanced. You'll find by following, following the polyatomic ions that the rest of them fall into place is balancing. Okay? So this reaction here is already balanced. Let me erase all that. Already balanced. Okay, and don't forget to. Make sure that you follow the ions as a group. We can't, we can't, uh, it looks like we're gonna go over a little bit. So you have to leave and go right ahead. I just wanna finish up these slides. So, but I will, when I get done here, I will uh, upload. It takes a day or so to get them uploaded so you can follow through with the rest of, rest of the lecture. Okay, I'm told my internet connection is being unstable. Yeah. Okay, so here's the next reaction. We got lead nitrate reacting with potassium iodide. A good flag is that crazy lead. It's one of the heavy met heavy metals. You see lead up there, you can probably be 95% sure that you're going to get a product that's insoluble, especially if you're dealing with a iodide any type of halogen. And so we exchange the partners. So we end up with lead iodide and potassium nitrate. Okay. We check the solubility rules. The fact that you got potassium right there is part of number one, always be soluble. Hence we've got an aqueous solution. You got an iodide, iodide normally soluble, okay, normally soluble, but it's partnered with lead, which makes it insoluble, hence we got a solid, okay, hence we got a precipitate, hence we got a reaction. All right, here's another one. Again, we have silver, good flag to tell you, mm, good chance I'm gonna have a precipitate. Okay, so plus the fact that you got a chloride over here on this side, 
So we got barium chloride reactive with silver nitrate. Okay, we've changed the partners. Whoa, wrong direction, sorry. You end up with barium nitrate and silver chloride. Okay, you know that the nitrates are soluble regardless of who they're bonded with. So hence, this is soluble, barium nitrate. We know that chlorides are normally soluble, but they're bonded with silver. Okay, therefore we get a precipitate and reaction proceeds as written. Okay, when we talk about redox reactions, what this is, and encompasses a majority of these reactions we talk about, single replacement, combination, decomposition. Um, way back when we were talking about losing electrons and gaining electrons. When an element lost an electron and became positive, we call that oxidation, okay? When an element gains an electron, it has a negative charge. We call that reduction. So what, what, what has been done is the term reduction and oxidation have been combined to give you the term redox. They've been combined because one doesn't happen without the other. There's a redox reaction occurring right now in your, in your battery of what you're using now to run your electronics. One side of the battery is losing electrons, the other side is gaining electrons. Okay, we call that a redox reaction. Okay, so in, in the reduction, the element's charge goes down. Okay, oxidation, the element charge goes up. Okay. You can't have one without the other, or vice versa. They occur spontaneously. Okay. A refresher memory with respect to the periodic table. Remember that in group one, we have a plus one ions, group two plus two, group three has a plus three. Group four, that depends. They're, they're on the on top of the fence there. They can lose four electrons or gain four electrons. Depends on the conditions. Then following past that, everybody gains electrons. So group five, they pick up three electrons, hence has a negative three. Group six, negative two charge, they picked up two. And group seven has a negative one because they picked up one electron. So refresh your memory of the periodic table and what kind of charge the elements will have. And we're talking about only the, the A elements. The B elements are not, you can't predict them accurately, and they vary. Okay, we also know group A, we're not gonna have an oxidation number because the octet is full, noble gases. Okay, they have their octet is happy. I also told you, those elements that have a constant oxidation number, group one, group two, and then we talked about silver always has a plus one, zinc always has a plus two, cadmium always has a plus two, but also uh, aluminum always has a plus three, okay? Remember the 16 elements, the sweet 16 as I call them. All right, so when oxidation occurs, charge goes up. So if we look at this example here, we have elemental copper with a zero charge. Remember, all, all the elements have a zero charge. Why? Because they have an equal number of protons, equal number of electrons, hence a zero charge. When copper loses two electrons, it undergoes oxidation. So in this case, the number goes up from a zero to a plus two, okay? What is oxidized, in this case, the copper metal, we call that a reducing agent because it supplied the electrons for somebody else to pick up. <laughs> so it's a reducing agent. It supplied the electrons for some other chemical element to be reduced. Okay. Reduction, that is the gain of electrons. Sometimes, some way, sometimes to remember this, maybe RE, the return of electrons, maybe to help you out. 
when we gain electrons, the charge goes down. Okay, so if you look at sulfur, who has a zero charge, now becomes a negative two. So it's charge of zero down to negative two. Okay, so sulfur is reduced, and that being the case, it becomes the reducing agent. Okay, so let's let's do a couple of examples there for explanations, further explanations. All this information here is basically what I'm going to tell you in the next slide. All right, for example, we have this reaction here. We have copper ion reacting with metal to give us copper solid and uh, iron two. So copper went from a plus two to a zero charge. Okay, so its charge went down. It was reduced. Iron, element of iron went from a zero to a plus two. It lost two electrons. So its charge went up. Okay, so it becomes oxidized. Meaning that what is oxidized? The iron is oxidized. What is reduced is the copper two ion. Therefore, copper two ion is called the oxidizing agent. And iron, solid iron, is called the reducing agent. Okay. All right. No worries. If you need to sign out, you feel free. No problems. We're almost done here. We've got a few more slides. All right. Here's a real life example. This is called cobalt nitrate, specifically cobalt 3 nitrate, reacting with platinum to give you. Um, nitrate and cobalt okay so here cobalt 3 nitrate goes from a plus 3 charge excuse me, yeah plus 3 charge to zero so it gained electrons okay platinum went from zero to plus three. So it gained three electrons. So what is oxidized here is the platinum. What is reduced is the cobalt three nitrate. Okay. Therefore the cobalt three nitrate is called the oxidizing agent. Okay. And the platinum metal is called the reducing agent. So what is the name of cobalt nitrate? Um, how do we know that's cobalt three? We're a polyatomic ion cable. NO3 is a negative three charge. We have three of them there. So that implies that cobalt must be cobalt three. So we use Roman numeral three to name it. Well, make sure you, again, I can overemphasize the YouTube videos. Obviously, this type of lecture, you know, it's a little more different than we, if we were face-to-face because -face, we could write on the board, you could raise your hand. I mean, feel free. If there's questions while I'm talking, you use the chat. If you have a hand function, you can push to alert me that you have a question. Feel free. So. Anyway, let me summarize this chapter and be familiar with the solubility rules, how to use them. They're on the periodic table. Be familiar with the activity series and how to use them. Okay. Be able to recognize and balance combination reactions. Okay. Uh, the same is true for decomposition reactions. Recognize, write the products, and balance the single replacement reactions and double replacement reactions. Now remember the single replacement reactions, those you use the activity series, the double replacement reactions you use the solubility table. And that is driven by the solubility and aqueous solutions. Okay. Single replacement reactions, that is dr driven by the most reactive metal. Okay. 
and acid-base reactions. Hopefully recognize that you're dealing with an acid, you're dealing with a base. The product you always get is water and then the corresponding salt. And then uh, combustion reaction. It's only combusting of hydrocarbons. Those are compounds made up of only of carbon and hydrogen. One reactant you always have, as you well know, to, for anything com to combust, you need oxygen. And the products that you, for us in 130, that you only get is carbon dioxide and water. When you balance these combustion reactions, uh, follow the, uh, the little guideline of balance the carbon first, the hydrogen, and finally the oxygen. For the acid base reaction, when you're balancing those, follow the hydroxides and the protons, okay? For the double replacement reactions, to balance those, follow the poly, polyatomic ions. Most of the time, that's what you're dealing with, polyatomic ions. And then uh, be able to identify what is oxidized, what is reduced, basically, what, you know, who, who lost electrons, who gained electrons in a, in a reaction, okay? All right, and their corresponding agent. Other than that, Congratulations, we just muddled through another chapter. Uh, actually, we're a little bit behind it, are we? Yeah, just a little bit, one minute. All right, um, I'm going to stop the recording now and